What's going on, everybody? Thanks for making Locked On Nationals your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcast. Well, guys, we're in the last few games in the Nats season, and you know what? It's been a tough year for everybody. We lead the majors in losses, all the bad stats. We have two pitchers who give up multiple home runs every time they start. It's been a tough season. But before we get into that tough season like we have in the past, I want to first give out some what the DC media gave for their player of the year, pitcher of the year, and good guy of the year, starting up right after this. You are Locked On Nationals, your daily Washington Nationals podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, everybody, welcome back. So the Nationals DC media, they have their awards and they have officially publicized them. And so I kind of want to take a look at it and maybe who I would give out as some of my player of the years, as well as a pitcher of the year and a good guy of the year award for someone who's helped around in the community and does just that week in and week out for the DC family. So first off, let's get to the pitcher of the year. The 2022 Nationals Pitcher of the Year, according to the D.C. media, is Erasmo Ramirez. Did you have that in your cards, in your bingo card to start out the season? Did you have Erasmo Ramirez winning the Pitcher of the Year for your Washington Nationals? So I can tell you this, I did not. And I'll say that confidently. I don't think anyone did. I have his stats right here in front of me. and. They're good stats. Like, there's nothing wrong with the Rosmo Ramirez winning the Pitcher of the Year award. He's a good pitcher. He's done well for us. But he wasn't really, mm, he wasn't, he wasn't really high at the top of the list for me for uh, expectations when I came into this year. I have him right here in front of me. He had 83 innings pitched this year at the tune of a 302 ERA. He's given up 11 home runs. He's walked 14 batters and he's had 58 strikeouts. And again, 83 innings pitched. Are those numbers going to light up a scoreboard? No, no. It, it The pitcher of the year award for, for the Nats this year, what it seems like is who gave up the least amount of runs? Who did or who who let the offense of the opposing team do the least amount of damage? That's basically what it came down to. And uh, that's kind of obvious to me. For me, I would have tried to go on like a Kyle Finnegan route. I think he's really come on the last few weeks here, especially. Uh, He's had two inning saves a couple times here and there. I mean, he's really starting to develop into what Rizzo kind of saw him out to be when uh, we signed him in the offseason of 2020 after coming off that World Series. You know, he signed him uh, to a major league deal. He never pitched in the majors the year before that. And so... I would have given it to Kyle Finnegan based on just the stuff that he's shown us this year. He's a young guy. Uh, he's definitely going to be a future piece for this pen and most likely the closer of the future, depending on what happens with Tanner Rainey. Um, but I would have given that to Kyle Finnegan, in my opinion. I just, I, I've seen it more from him this year. I think a Rosmo Ramirez was just fine, but he just, he kind of did the bare minimum. And so, Second, before we get to the player of the year award, the good guy award of the year goes to Nelson Cruz. Nothing wrong with that. I think if Josh Bell was here, he probably would have done that. And and then again, it's there's no issue with giving it to him over Josh Bell. Josh Bell did amazing things here when he was here, but up until we traded him, I'm assuming they had to go a different route and uh, pick someone who's been on the team for the whole year, which they did just that with Nelson Cruz. Nelson Cruz has done amazing things throughout this community. You see billboards and advertisements for him trying to get people into the community and do their part and uh, do their job. And so that's something that he's done well. And uh, I'm happy for Nelson Cruz for, because when we signed him this year, we expected to get the boomstick that he was told to be and that he was at one point in his career. But, I mean, he's older now. So it's kind of tough to, you know, 
really rely on him when he's past 40. You know, the downfall is going to come eventually for him. But, you know, he was still a great locker room guy. They didn't trade him at the deadline because they wanted him to kind of help out with these younger guys who would be making the move to the majors in the second half of the season. They kind of wanted him to be that mentor and uh, kind of help them close the gap from minor leaguer to a major leaguer. So I think that's something to watch out for. And with Nelson Cruz and what he's continued to do, obviously, like I said, the numbers haven't been there. They won't be there. And but he's still been a valuable piece off the field as well as on the field being a leader. And uh, I know some of the young guys like C.J. Abrams, I'm sure, uh, Key Bear Ruiz, some of the other international guys really appreciate what he's done and uh, what he's brought brought on to this team day in and day out. So at the least, like great job, Nelson Cruz, a good guy award. I'm always rooting for the people of D.C. and um, doing their part off the field. Lastly, the player of the year. Wow. Honestly, this one's a little sad because you're like, well, you got uh, Josh Bell. Josh Bell's looking pretty good, right? He's looking pretty good. Player of the year. Traded him. Uh huh. All right. Juan Soto. Childish Bambino. Juan Godo, as some of you know him, know him as. We traded him. So those two guys can't be the team MVP, which is fine, which is fine. I've, I've made my points clear on what I wanted and what I didn't want when, when we were at that July deadline. So, but nonetheless, your team MVP of the 2022 national season is drum roll. Boom. Outfielder Lane Thomas. And honestly, a lot of people are going to be like, how do you give it to Lane Thomas and not Kiber Ruiz or, or some of the other guys? See, uh, name another Nat. Well, yeah, his numbers haven't been outstanding, as some would say. They're not crazy great numbers. Again, this is the worst team in baseball right now. It's young pieces right now. We just need experience going into this year. And Lane Thomas has brought that, I guess. He's brought that experience. He's been in the major since 2019. And he's been up and down. You know, we got him from the Cardinals. And again, let's let's look back at that trade. We traded John Lester for Lane Thomas, who is now our 2022 MVP for your Nationals. John Lester, if you guys remember, the guy who flicked the birds of the two Nats fans who were chanting his name as he got traded away to the Cardinals. Flipped them the bird. And guess who we got in return? Our MVP, Lane Thomas. And honestly, like jokes aside, bits aside, Lane Thomas is a piece for the future. If you if you're counting out Lane Thomas to be one of the corner outfielders for the next few years, like you're missing out in the boat. This guy's got a lot of power. He's got a lot of talent. And I, I've really enjoyed that over the last few months, especially. He's really turned it into gear in the second half. He started off slow, and you know, that's unfortunate because it's like you don't want to see him start off slow, but he's really picked it up since then. You know, he's his average exit velocity is really good compared to what it's been in years past for him. I'm seeing some of his home runs have picked up and went first off when he gets a hold of the ball, he kills it. No one, we really underestimate the power that he brings sometimes. And certainly that's something that I'm not going to be, you know, I'm not just going to gloss over that. The guy's got power. He's got raw tools to be able to make it in the major leagues. Like right now, I have his stats up in from September. He's batting 265 with a 349 OBP and a 427 slugging percentage, 777 OPS. Pretty good numbers. He's got three home runs in 27 games and 126 at bats. You know, it's not nothing crazy, but, you know, he's, he's drawn 14 walks so far compared to 25 strikeouts. It's not a terrible strikeout to walk ratio. So he's just been our most level player so far this year. If you exclude Josh Bell and Juan Soto, which obviously that's what the DC media did here. Lane Thomas has been with us. Uh, he's been productive for the most part, especially in the second half, like I was getting to, but uh, again, like I think he's something to look forward to in the future for this fun 
rebuilding Nats team. But honestly, as long as long as the MVP award wasn't given the, I mean, Cesar Hernandez still like I, I I can't stand watching him go out there. If I'm being honest, I, it's just not for me. The Cesar experiment is not for me. It hasn't been for me, and it won't be for me. I want to see the young guys play, and I think Lane Thomas fits in that core to be, you know, part of the, one of the future division champion teams, maybe in 2024. I think Lane Thomas will definitely be there if if it's a fourth outfielder or if he's starting in left field or right field or wherever you may be. And then back to another MVP candidate, quote-unquote, it's not going to be Victor Robles. I can tell you that he's made amazing catches in center field, but again, at the plate inconsistencies all over the place. You see it, you hear about it. People talk about it. Davey talks about it. So it wasn't going to go to him, even though he's had a, a great year in the field, in my opinion, and he's making a bunch of web gem plays, but that's not enough to give you the MVP just for now, at least. So I don't know. I think it'll be fine. I hope, but I guess we'll see it from here. But also, first off, I just want to get to one of our second segments that we have coming up here. I want to take a look at some of just, you know, I want to get back into the conversation that I was having with the Nats being the heel. And before I do that, I want to give you a little special message that we have. So right now, if you haven't tried Built Bar Puffs yet, you are depriving yourself of one of life's greatest joys. And guess what? There's a new flavor ready. Delicious, indulgent cookie dough covered in chocolate. That's right. Built has done it again. Let me introduce you to your new favorite cookie dough chunk puffs. Have a light and chewy texture, real cookie dough chunks. And of course, they're covered in 100% real chocolate. All of the joys of eating cookie dough without the hassle of making it. Plus, it's healthy for you. I love healthy. I can tell you that cookie dough chunk puffs are only 160 calories and they have a whopping 15 grams of protein in them. Run to built.com to snag a box for you and the family. It will be the perfect treat or you can find a really good hiding place and just hoard them for yourself like I do. I hide them uh, actually where my dogs keep their treats. So don't tell anyone that. But like all like all built bars, the new cookie dough chunk puff is covered in 100% real chocolate. That means they're healthy and tasty. Chocolate-covered cookie dough with the light, fluffy texture. So good. What's great about Built is that all their bars are made with collagen protein, which your body absorbs more efficiently and provides tons of healthy benefits. Eat something that tastes good and is good for you. You are going to love the new cookie dough chunk puff, whether you need a snack for your workout, a late-night treat, or just need to grab a quick bite. Built is a perfect protein bar, and they taste better than a candy bar. Ditch your calories, fat, and sugar. Grab yourself a built bar. And the offer is go to built.com, use promo code locked on 15 and get 15% off your order. Use promo locked on 15. And so back to what I was saying with the Nats being the heel for this season. It, look at it the last few days with the Nationals. You know, we stole one of the doubleheaders on Saturday just blowing them out. They had to bring in a fielder to pitch in the ninth inning, or actually in the bottom of the eighth inning, rather. And that was a massive game for the Phillies because they had two that day. You have to get at least one of those. And the first game of the day, you're going to get your doors blown off by a crappy Nationals team that just hasn't shown much, obviously. We're, we're the worst team in baseball. And that was just so much fun to watch, you know. It's funny, uh, one of my pals, Grant Paulson from uh, 1067 The Fan, is uh, he's friends with Kyle Gibson, the Philly starter. And so, you know, we got to meet him actually last year on the field. Really cool guy. I I root for him, I'm not going to lie, unless when he's facing the Nats. But I texted Grant yesterday. I was like, hey, before this game, I'm not rooting for Kyle Gibson today. I'm rooting for the Nats. I want to squander the Phillies postseason chances. And we helped did that. We exploded. We had over 10 runs yesterday. We had 13 runs total. Uh, CJ Abrams had three hits in last night's game or in yesterday's game on Saturday, not yesterday, Saturday's game. And, you know, he just, 
did a good job. Again, this is someone who's been hitting and he's been hitting for a while now. And so he's hitting for average, especially the power's not there, not there yet, but it's going to come around. And, you know, I'm, I'm just looking forward to it, especially as we come up to this final home stretch or the final away stretch. Really, we're not even on at home anymore after Sunday. So I just look forward to the Nats playing the heel. I want them to be that annoying, pesky team that we were. And so that's what we provided yesterday morning or yes, or not yesterday. I keep on saying yesterday. It was Saturday. And so I have the stats right here. CJ Abrams had three hits. He had one run total. And also after Davey Martinez called him out or not really called him out, but in his post game press conference on, uh, I believe after Tuesday night of last week, Davey wasn't too happy after uh, CJ Abrams didn't run out. Uh, that could have been a game, a potential game saving hit. Uh, he kind of was slow out of the box and it was kind of a good moment. Like, Hey, like Rook, this time is now like you gotta you gotta run to first you gotta hustle when you're a young guy like that you haven't shown us anything yet at that point you gotta run to first and so what he did on saturday the first game of the two he ran two inf infield singles out and if you haven't looked then you will see that he busted his tail and he ran down there like i've never seen before you can see the message got through him, but that is obvious. Nothing has hindered that. He got the message, and he did that. He did just that. He hustled down the line and made the move that you're supposed to make as a pro. And I, I just love seeing that. He got the message clear to him. The young buck knows now, hey, I got I to gotta earn my stripes, you know? As some of the Yankees fans would say, you got to earn your pinstripes. But in this, you got to earn that curly W. As what Davey didn't say, but what he should say, you got to earn that curly W. You got to earn that curly W on your left pack right there, you know? And so I think he did just that. He got the message. And of course, yesterday in a big game, big game for us, and of course, a massive game for the Phillies was he did just that. He hustled out two big infield singles. And he made some noise on the base path as well, eventually scoring in one of those. So that's something I just love to see. And again, kudos to CJ Abrams for that. We've been seeing it a lot more recently at the plate. I have it here right now. He's hitting in September. He, well, actually not really in September, but I have him hitting. He's improved his batting average a lot is what my point I want to say. I closed the screen out like a moron. But right now with the Nationals, he's hitting a whopping 260 compared to what he was hitting in the low 200s and really struggling his first few weeks at the plate. But he's starting to find his feet right now. He's batting 300 in September. The potential's there, man. And I think he's starting to realize it, that this is all on him. And he has the opportunities to make it as a pro. And especially with this team that's rebuilding, He's got the opportunity to. I want to touch on C.J. Abrams again, but I also just want to, you know, highlight Joey Manessis, that stud that we have, the 30-year-old monster that this guy just keeps on producing year in, year out. Not year in, day in, day out. 30-year-old rookie. I mean, back to the MVP conversation. Talk about MVP. It could be Joey Manessis even. I mean – how do you not say that at the pace that he's on right now? He is by far an all, an all, an all star. If we were going by the beginning of the year, if there's an all star for the second half, so he would easily be in that. I mean, he's been one of the better hitters in the second half of this year and by far and away for the nationals, he's been the best hitter and on the majors for even this season. If you look at it, he was better than Josh, uh, I don't know about Josh Bell thinking about it. Josh Bell was great here this first half. He had an awesome first half, and not a lot of people were pitching to him. But Joey Manessis, it's hard to, you know, make that argument that he's not been our best hitter all year with or without Soto. So that's been fun to watch. Like right now, I have his numbers up in September. He's even more scorching hot than he has been over the last few months. Right now, he's sitting 330. Three, he's hitting 330. 
in September. That's awesome. He has a 583 slugging percentage, and he's getting on base at a 38% rate for a good for a 961 OPS. Oh, my God. I mean, I don't know what to say about this guy. And also, he's got seven home runs and 127 plate appearances in September. What do I have to say about this guy anymore? His name is in ink on that lineup card for opening day in 2023. I can tell you that right now, right this second. He's got to be in there. He has to be. If it's not at first base and it's DH, he's got to be in that lineup. I don't care if he has zero hits in spring training through 20 games. Doesn't matter. His name is in ink in that lineup card. You know, I am I I believe this when I say this. For a rebuilding team, I, I say this. You don't waste your time on people who won't be there for the future. And Joey Maness is kind of, he's right in that fence to where it's like, is he a piece to the future? He's 30 years old. He's just got called up to the majors in August. Like, or is he too old? Or where is he? You know, at first I was like, hey, this is an awesome story. This guy, Joey Manessis, but eh, we, we just got to get younger. That's what we got to focus on right now. But dang, now that we're in October and he's still doing this, how do you not have him in the opening day lineup next year and being a big part of this team? I, I, I just don't see it. I don't see it how he won't be in this lineup to start out next year. He's been our best hitter in the second half by far. Even, like I said earlier, put Juan Soto and Josh Bell into the equation, and guess what? He's, again, our best hitter this year. The numbers don't lie, guys. And I get it. People are like, oh, Juan, no one was pitching to Juan Soto when he was here. No one was pitching to him. I know. I get it. But still, Joey Manessis, he's been, con he's been consistent. You don't really have to worry about him. It's just, hey, man. You give him the bat, you give him the helmet, batting gloves, eye black, and he's like, all right, I'm good to go. Steps up in that plate, and he strokes it, man. He strokes it. So it's just I, I'm at a loss of words as far as Joey Manessis at this point. I'm just excited to see what Davey in this front office will do with him next year, you know, because it's a little – we're in that kind of weird scenario to where do we think that he – will be there in the lineup i don't know will he it's a weird situation but all right before we la we wrap up today's show i want to get to the fact that just nats fans however you're listening to this or watching this just just think of this with me think about it it's 2010 you have the Philadelphia Phillies fans taking over Nationals Park. There's 60% Phillies fans in the stadium going nuts, going crazy while our team stinks. And we all we hope for is, well, Steven Strasburg will be here one day. Bryce Harper will be too. Maybe Anthony Rendon. Maybe we have some more high picks. Guys, all those years of Phillies fans put us down in our own house. It's time to pay it forward. And I think we have done just that by being the heel of the Phillies this season. And especially coming up right now to the edge of October where they haven't made the playoffs since 2011. You don't think those Phillies fans want to make the playoffs at this point? You paid Bryce Harper. You paid Nick Castellanos. You have 10 years worth of terrible pit or great picks. Great, high draft position. What do you have to show for it? You bought Bryce Harper. Obviously, Aaron Nola has been one of those high picks, and he's turned out amazing. They have a couple more as well, with some on the way. But 10 years of being terrible, and you have nothing to show for it besides paying Bryce Harper a boatload of money, which is still in debate. Is that worth it? I don't know. But this is the year for them to make the postseason, and I just don't know if they will. And the Nats beating them yesterday, how does Rob Thompson go into that dugout for game two of the series and is like, hey, guys, let's get fired up. You're playing the worst team in baseball right now. You haven't played in a postseason game since 2011 or not anyone on the roster, but 
the Phillies in general haven't played since 2011. How are you going to get them fired up after losing to the worst team in baseball? With By the way, there's like 500 fans there. That's sarcastic, but bear with me. There's not many people there. And honestly, I'm willing to bet half those fans were probably Phillies fans, as they should be. They're in a playoff race right now. They're trying to make postseason for the first time since 2011. How do you not fill that ballpark up like you used to back in the day when you guys were the big, tough Philly fans and we're going to take over the park. We're going to take buses down to D.C. and take over their beautiful new park. That's cool, man. But guess what? The Phillies are all bark and no bite, just like we knew. You kind of just knew this team was fraudulent. I, as we sit here on Monday, October 3rd, I don't think the Phillies make the postseason. May, that's a hot take, I think, a little bit. And I think it's wishful thinking, but I don't think they make it. And if they do make it, I'm not buying them as a team to be afraid of in October. I'm not. They don't have much experience on their hands. In fact, they're barely squeaking in after being so hot. To so In August and late July, they were on a steamer. They were like, oh, yeah, the Phillies are going to make the playoffs. No problem. They'll be there in October. Yeah. They're there in October because the regular season starts in October, or rather ends in October the first week. But will they be there beyond that for the postseason? I don't know. But I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. I'm going to say they don't make the postseason. Well, all right, guys. Today's been a fun show. There's going to be a wild week of baseball. And again, I can't wait for it. None of you can. And I can tell you right now, there's a podcast out there that's going to be able to help you with this day in and day out. And I just like to give them a little shout out to the Locked On MLB podcast. First off, I'd like to thank you guys for making Locked On Nationals your first listen today. Now make your second listen, the Locked On MLB podcast. MLB expert Paul Francis Sullivan brings humor, passion, and unique perspective on every team and the biggest stories around the league. Follow the number one league-wide podcast, Locked On MLB, on the ad Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcast. All right, everybody. You have a good day. I will talk to you on Tuesday. Hopefully the Phillies lose. Uh, I don't really care about the Mets and the Braves. They're already in it, and unfortunately, I think they're really good. So that kind of sucks, whatever. But hopefully we can control what we can control and, you know, Hopefully the Phillies miss out in the postseason. That'd be a lot of fun. So I'm rooting for that. All right, guys, you have a good day, and I will see you tomorrow. Thanks for tuning in. Catch you later, everybody.